Okay, so it's quarter past uh, two. Actually, I must say that you are lucky because I lectured in uh, China and I noticed that there the doors have a handle only on the inside. So once the time uh, of the lecture comes, then the lecturer just closes the door and that's it. <laughs> so we are not yet uh, so advanced. It reminds me another story that I uh, once had to make an announcement in Amsterdam during uh, a lecture. So I thought, what's the best moment to tell the announcement? Because people always come late or leave, don't uh, show up after break. So I wisely selected the last moment before break. So I made an announcement and then uh, another student came. Okay, so I try now not to make public announcements. Okay, so um, thank you for coming. So I want to uh, resume uh, these lectures by discussing a specific class of games. But to understand this class of games, uh, one needs to have uh, uh, some understanding uh, what are its properties, uh, their properties. So I will introduce first some concepts, but they will be especially useful to study these games. And these games are called congestion games. Congestion is traffic jam. So these are games which try to understand uh, how to avoid traffic jams. And uh, the story is uh, organized as follows. So first I will introduce a very naive but useful way of trying to find the Nash equilibrium. It's called best response dynamics. It's kind of every child would come up with it. Then we will uh, try to figure out when uh, this uh, procedure makes sense. And for this we need a concept of potential. It sounds perhaps to you familiar, it is a very general concept which actually is also used in physics. So it, it has some similarities. Then I'll introduce these uh, games about traffic jams called congestion games. And then I'll introduce a, a very striking paradox, which uh, on purpose I will not say now anything, but you will be amazed uh, as everybody when uh, he or she uh, is confronted with this for the first time. And then I will discuss uh, a certain concept which is called price of anarchy, which was introduced by computer scientists and it is used to uh, measure the discrepancy between uh, social optimum and uh, Nash equilibrium. Something which is a driving message behind all these examples. Because the games which are really interesting are the ones where social optimum differs from Nash equilibrium. And all the examples which I showed to you, except this battle of sexes, have this uh, property. And such games are puzzling and we want to understand how to cope with this discrepancy. So this price of an uh, anarchy measures it. After the break, I'll discuss uh, an alternative approach which tries to repair this discrepancy. So a special case of these congestion games is called uh, fair cost sharing games and they are useful in their own rights and I'll discuss them separately. So, uh, best response dynamics. So, suppose that we have a strategic game for n players. So, each player has a set of strategies SI and the payoff function PI defined on the, as you remember, Cartesian product of their strategies. And then, suppose that uh, I ask somebody find the Nash equilibrium in this game. So he starts to think, suppose the game is finite. So he just picks some joint strategy and thinks, hmm, is this Nash equilibrium? Let's see. Informally, Nash equilibrium is a joint strategy that every player is satisfied. So you just check, is every player satisfied? You see a player not satisfied. Aha, so let him make 
a change so that he will be satisfied. So he changes his strategy to a best response to what the others did. We get a new joint strategy. Again, we can ask ourselves, is this Nash equilibrium? Well, so let us check if all players are satisfied. If not, we just repeat it. And this is exactly what this algorithm is. Here is a new technology which you can uh, marvel at. So uh, best response dynamics, simply you start anywhere and you check. It is not Nash equilibrium, so choose a player who is not happy and uh, let him play a best response and you continue. So it's really trivial. Now we can ask ourselves, is this any good? So, first of all, there can be Nash equilibria which are never reached. So this is a game which is a bit strange game. Do you remember this head of tails? Okay, so uh, rem remove the E strategy, then you get head of tails. So I now, uh, the game is that somebody throws a coin and then if it is both head, then uh, the payoff to the first player is one and the other minus one. But suppose that this person who throws the coin has this incredible talent that occasionally he succeeds and the coin lands on the edge. So in that case, everybody get min gets, uh, both of them get minus one. And this is what explains this additional row and column. Now, uh, does this game have a Nash equilibrium? Okay, so I make a break for half an hour. You remember that in this uh, left uh, square, two by two, left upper square, there is no Nash equilibrium because it goes in cycle. But is there a Nash equilibrium in this game? Sorry? E, e yes, because look, if this is the outcome, then you can ask uh, bo uh, each player, are you satisfied? Well, he just only looks what he can get if he switches to another strategy, but he will also get minus one. So it's really a very bad Nash equilibrium, but it is a Nash equilibrium. Now, this best response dynamics may miss it because it can go around in this original uh, head uh, the matching pennies game and never reach this E edge. So, as a result, uh, th this E uh, um, uh, strategy. So, it will circle there and uh, there will be Nash equilibrium, but it will not find. So, it is really a very naive procedure. And uh, now uh, we can ask ourselves how to find a game or characterize games for which this procedure makes sense and always does, uh, uh, does find a Nash equilibrium. Remember that it's completely arbitrary. We let any player who is not satisfied to choose a new strategy, and moreover, we don't tell him which strategy, strategy to choose. He only has or she has to choose a best strategy, best reply. So, uh, Monderer and Shapley, the one whom I mentioned yesterday, introduced a concept of a potential. So, potential is uh, one single function also defined on the Cartesian product. So the difference is that when you take a payoff function, uh, we know that it's associated with a specific player. Potential is not. So just to make it uh, different, I use a capital letter for it. Now, what is a potential? So it's also like payoff function, function from joint strategies to numbers, which tracks changes in payoff. So if some player changes the strategy on the slide player i, so he changed from s i to s prime minus, uh, s prime i. The other players did not switch. Now we can wonder, did he gain anything? So we compute the difference. This is on the left-hand side, so uh, here. And then we wonder, does this difference, can we track it? Yes, the function p does it. 
So the function p tracks this change. And this function says, uh, it's, for example, if the player switch to S prime, which is worse, then this function not only uh, will track it, it will exactly drop by the same amount. So uh, the fun uh, a potential game, by definition, is a game which has a potential. Now, uh, several games don't have, some do. And there are some very interesting ones which do. But first, let us understand better the notion of potential. So, uh, prisoner's dilemma, if you remember, had this uh, form. And this is a function with a potential. A proof is at the bottom. Because uh, look what happens. Uh, just uh, this intuition is uh, helpful to understand what happens here. But to check that it's a potential, let us choose two adjacent squares, like the one where there is zero and one in this bottom square. Now, what do these uh, squares mean? They mean that the function p, the potential, when defined on the joint strategy cc, delivers zero, and when it is applied to cd, it delivers one. So the difference is minus one, if you start from cc. Now, if the player uh, changes a strategy so that the game moves, so to say, from cc to cd, then it must be player two. Now you should look at the top part. So player two changed, and he moved from cc to cd, and then his payoff went from two to one, uh, two to three, because we have this here two two and here uh, zero three. So his payoff went up by one, and this is here recorded perfectly. Yes. So for this change, we we uh, did uh, what we needed. We checked it is for this change indeed potential, but there will be four such checks and each of them is equally obvious. So potential delivers a matrix, while the game originally is a bimatrix. In every entry there are two numbers. So potential does not record which player made a change, it only records uh, the changes in payoff, and which player change we can deduce it, because it always moves either in one direction or the other. And you can check that, as I said, that we checked only, we did 25% of work, that at the bottom we have a definition of potential. And if you look at the intuition, then you can see that this records the number of players who chose D, or whom we call defecting players. For example, in DD, there are two players who defected, and the value of the potential is two. So this proves that Prisoner's Dilemma is a game uh, with a potential or potential game. But now uh, let us consider Prisoner's Dilemma for n players. So I cannot already easily draw uh, some nice uh, matrices. Uh, but still, the potential is as simple as it was before. Here it is. So this potential now uh, in this more general setting, confirms this observation that it counts the number of players who chose the fact. Why? Because if you look at the payoff here, then the payoff is 1 when it was formerly C, so cooperate, and uh, 0 is for defect. So if I deduct in the definition of PS from N this sum, then I deduct, uh, then what is left is the number of players who chose one, uh, who chose zero. Because originally n is, let's say, if everybody would choose uh, c, and then uh, we deduct those uh, who indeed did it, so the rest will be those who defected. So this is and a proof is as simple as you can imagine, because all what we need to do is to check what happens when one player changes. And this is this observation here. 
that when a player uh, changes, uh, let me move this, yeah, if a player changes, say, from 0 to 1, then his payoff goes to 1. You just can see the, uh, the um, let's say, uh, the difference is 1. In other, uh, in other words, if he chooses, uh, switches from 0 to 1, his payoff drops by 1. And uh, the same happens with the potential. You can see, therefore, the potential is exactly tracks uh, to the letter, so to say, uh, the changes in payoffs, independently of the player. Okay, so, so far we know that uh, prisoner's dilemma for n players is also a potential game. So a good question is, so what? Now, the answer is that for games which have potential, the best response dynamics always terminates. And this is a surprisingly simple result. The proof is one line, but just uh, think about it. You have a potential. Now, best response dynamic keeps uh, changing from one joint strategy to another. How is the change achieved? One player gets better off. Now, if the game has potential, then this potential goes up because we change from one joint strat strategy to another by saying that some player got, so to say, second chance. This change is an improvement for the player. So the same improvement is recorded in the potential. So the potential keeps going up, the game is finite, and as a result it will eventually stop. Once it stops, then we are necessarily in a Nash equilibrium. Because if it were not a Nash equilibrium, some player could have chosen a strategy which for him is better off, he would move on, but then we get a higher potential contradiction because we chose a joint strategy which maximizes the potential. In short, if a game has a potential and is finite, then every maximum of the potential is a Nash equilibrium. Okay, so one could therefore, it's yet another way to double check that the uh, prisoner's dilemma for N's player has a Nash equilibrium. Of course, a terribly roundabout way to reason, but it is a side effect or a corollary to this result. So, we also realized that this game with this bad Nash equilibrium with this edge, where it was minus one, minus one, is a game without potential. So, now uh, we want to understand how to characterize the games which have a potential. Uh, and it can be done. Uh, so, uh, one needs to introduce uh, a couple of very simple notions. We talked about a best response, but if you are not so uh, critical or not so demanding, you can simply settle for a better response. A player does not like this strategy, it means he, he can or she can change it to a strategy which yields a better uh, payoff, not the best payoff it will be a reason to move on. So suppose that we start in some joint strategy and there is some player who is not satisfied, he switches to a better strategy, a better response, we get a new joint strategy and it continues this way. And you continue until you can't. If you can't, it means you necessarily reached by definition Nash equilibrium. And this path can be infinite, like in this game with bad, bad Nash equilibrium. So, such an infinite or finite but maximal path is called a finite, uh, an improvement path. And a statement uh, which uh, is uh, made uh, in the last uh, bullet is that if Every improvement path is finite, then the name for such a property is that the game has the finite improvement property. So, if this is the case, then the game has Nash equilibrium proof. Just choose an arbitrary, uh, finite, uh, arbitrary improvement path, it's finite, and choose its last joint strategy. 
So this uh, definition is here split in two, but uh, I assume that uh, you can easily see um, from what I said that it is exactly the same. So it is uh, a path is just a, a, joint, a sequence of joint strategies such that each pair differs only with respect to one player. And it's improvement if this change is caused by the player who got better off by this change, that he selected a better reply. So in one direction we have that if the game has finite improvement property, then it has Nash equilibrium. But uh, now we would like to have a characterization of these games which uh, the enjoy the property of having finite improvement pro uh, uh, the games which have the finite improvement property. So it is tempting to say these are the games which have potential. Well, it's not exactly right. So you have to make the definition of potential slightly more liberal. And the right generalization, it proceeds in two steps. I cut out the middle one uh, because of time. And uh, the, uh, the second improvement is called generalized ordinal potential. Ordinal is that it doesn't count, but only the, so to say, sign of the change. And this implication, which is stated here, uh, is, uh, you see the word implies here, so the function is a generalized uh, ordinal potential if the following holds. For every player, if he chooses a better response, then the potential goes up. That's all what it says. So potential only tracks the sign of the change. So if he chose, say, a worse response, then the potential goes down. Or by, let's say, the, if he didn't, um, if the same uh, payoff resulted, then the potential does not change. So this is the, um, this is the only condition. So we don't uh, insist anymore that the change is numerically the same. It's in the same direction. And here is a simple example. This game, you can easily see that it does not have potential. And one way to look at it is that if you move uh, from, uh, let's say, we move uh, around the clock starting with TL. So uh, we move, uh, suppose that it has potential. So this potential would not change if you move from TL to TR, because this is moved due to player two and his payoff does not change. Then we go down, this goes uh, now, down by two, because this is the change caused by player uh, from here to here. It is caused by the other player, by player, the row player. So until now we recorded the potential dropped by two. Now we move left, so this is caused by the column player, and then it went down by one. So we already dropped three. And now we move from BL, we move from BL up, and it again went down by one. So we dropped by four, but we ended up in the same place. So it can't be. So this is, in fact, there is a property that any rectangle in the payoff matrix, if you travel through it, you have to add, it has to add up so that it is zero. And here it added up to minus four. So this game does not have a, uh, potential, but it has a generalized potential, and I wrote it down here. And the way to check it is just to see what happens. In this game, uh, we change, suppose, from CC to CD. So I'll just do this example. So here, if we change, then we have uh, from TL to TR in the game, and in that change, nothing happened. So I don't even need to uh, check this implication. It is not, uh, there is no condition put on uh, such a situation. But if I, for example, move from uh, TL down to BL, so here, then 
it went up by one and the potential by chance recorded also increased by one. But if I move from, uh, let's say, let me see, from DD uh, to CD, then the potential went up by one, whereas here the payoff went up by two because it is change caused by the role player. So I'm just showing to you that this is a generalized potential. You just need to check four cases and that this game does not have a potential. So now there is a theorem uh, of Monderer and Shapley which shows that uh, uh, the game has a generalized ordinal potential if and only if all uh, finite improve if if the game satisfies the has the FIP property so if and only if all um, improvement paths are finite and here is a uh, sketch of the proof. It is good to have an idea. This is not the original proof. Uh, another person found a simple argument. In one direction it is as before. If a game has a generalized ordinal potential and you take an improvement path, then uh, each change is because some player chose a better strategy. So this is exactly where the definition of generalized potential enters the picture. If a player improved payoff, then the uh, potential went up. And this was exactly on this, uh, in this definition. If it was, uh, where was it? Uh, oops, here. Uh, if this is, uh, you should think that he switched here uh, from, let's say, it should be the other way around to, uh, for this argument, that he switched from S prime to S, uh, Si. So if he went up, then the potential also went up. So this is very easy. It is like with the uh, argument with the potential. It equally well holds for generalized potential. But in the other direction, you have uh, a game which satisfies the finite improvement property and you have to come up with a definition of generalized potential. So what we have to do is to every single joint strategy we have to assign a number. Now a very elegant proof which uh, somebody came up with was the following. You just count for each joint strategy the number of such sequences which end up there. And this turns out to be the right definition. By sequences, I mean an initial segment of a finite, of a finite improvement path. So we assume that the game has this property, fi uh, finite improvement path property. We need to or, uh, define this generalized uh, ordinal potential. It turns out you just need to count the number of those path which end, uh, which end up there. And this turns out to be the right definition. The, the details are not needed, but all what we should understand is that there is a close correspondence uh, between those two notions. So the, this generalized form of potential characterizes the gains for which the finite improvement property holds. Therefore, it is useful to know uh, this because it means that these are the games for which now I would slightly change not best response dynamics, but better response dynamics term always terminates. So uh, now I will discuss a very important class of games, these uh, congestion games, but these are games where you need to pay and not that you get some reward. So we will talk about costs. So this will be games with costs, but it is nothing different. You just put minus in front of it and you get the payoffs. Because if costs are involved and the player is interested to minimize its cost. Whereas with payoffs, we were saying that a rational or egoistic player wants to maximize his payoff. 
he wants to minimize his cost, so just from this setup with costs, you produce the original gain by putting minus in front of the cost. And this, is, uh, this changes all definitions in a sort of mirror image. That the Nash equilibrium in a game with costs will be uh, a joint strategy such that no player can get a lower cost if he changes the strategy. It is uh, in the uh, class of games which are discussed uh, very uh, natural, so you will immediately adjust to it. You will not, so to say, have to remember, oh, I have to put minus. It just comes very natural. The definition is very long, but it is very easy to understand. So imagine the following. We have a network of roads. And these roads, like a map of Poland with connections between all cities. It is a good example of this beginning structure. And the players uh, travel from one place to another. So a strategy for a player is a path in this graph of these uh, roads in Poland. Now, how is the cost? The cost is the delay which he incurs by traveling or travel time. And uh, these players choose different roads and on some roads there will be more cars than on others. So it means first of all that the road will con uh, consist of segments and on each segment there can be different delays. So your cost is delay and it will be just accumulated delay over all uh, fragments of the road and uh, your delay will depend how many users also chose this segment. So with this information we can now read what happens here. So you have something which in general one talks about facilities but uh, it can be anything which uh, is useful to achieve your goal. So if you are, let's say, in a factory, so this will be like, suppose, a bicycle factory, then uh, these can be uh, facilities, can be, for example, a set of uh, wheels, uh, gears, uh, steering wheel, brakes, whatever, that you just choose a certain combination. So strategy is such a combination or a sequence of, uh, of um, uh, how to say, direct uh, seg road segments. So we also assume that players may have different sets of strategies because, let's say, suppose somebody only lives in Rzeszów and travels to Świnoujście and the other person from only from Warsaw to Kraków. So, uh, this is this uh, bullet that each player has a possibly different set of strategies. As I said, we use costs instead of payoffs. And now there is a delay function. So delay function depends uh, on the number of people who chose this road segment. So for uh, each, uh, if uh, there is uh, a facility J, uh, here it is. And for facility J, we have, uh, so this is a facility J, and for it we have a function which says what is the delay. And the delay depends how many people chose this facility. So we also have the set of users, and this is the set of users who uh, chose this specific facility. So the cost, as I said, is the delay accumulated over all uh, road segments. Sounds complicated, but uh, look at this simple example. Uh, can you read it? Everybody can read it? Okay, so uh, how many... Uh, there are here five drivers, if you see. There are three roads from... Katowice to Gliwice. People ask me, why did you choose these cities? The answer is, I have a twin sister who studied in Gliwice and we lived in Katowice. Does this answer potential question? Okay, so the, assume there are three roads. And these roads uh, are therefore very simple. It's just one edge. In general, it can be more complicated. There will be another example. So, 
suppose that the delays are as follows. On the leftmost row, the delay is one. So read about read travel time if you have a problem with the word delay. If there is one uh, user, so one driver, delay is one. If there are two, it's two. If there are three, it's three. On the middle road, one driver, delay one. Two drivers delay. Now you tell me you can read it. So uh, can you tell me what you see there? Bravo. Okay, four and three users, uh, five, correct? And then one, five, six. And now you see those five drivers. So two drivers chose uh, this middle road and three on the right. Now I told you you have no pro you will have no problem in using the concept of Nash equilibrium when we talk about costs. So I ask you a question: Is this a Nash equilibrium? No, no. So it's easy, very good. So why? Yes. Yeah, it's enough if you choose one, because there should be one person who is not satisfied. Excellent. So now we uh, formalize this as a congestion game, so that you will see that it is not something different, it's an example of congestion game. So there are five players, those red dots, three facilities, which are now here sort of elementary facilities, Official name for such a game is singleton uh, congestion game, that each facility is just uh, one, uh, let's say, unit. And the strategy is a road, yes? So each user has three strategies. And the cost function is defined here, which is the delay. Le if they uh, look how it is defined uh, for player I, if he chooses the first road on the left, and the number of other users who also chose it is one, then his delay is one. If its number is two, then it's two. And uh, I, I already removed the uh, this dot, 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 but if uh, there we were supposed to add something, then it would be uh, four, because we talk about the middle road there where I stopped uh, listing things. Uh, oops, how come doesn't, yes, uh, I went too far and it, what happens? Yes, I see a problem. I am confused with the buttons, sorry. Mm. Yes, so this is the official definition. In short, this intuitive picture is an example of a congestion uh, game. And just if somebody doubts, then he should just choose this definition. So now we had this example. It's not natural equilibrium, so let us see what could happen. So as uh, you suggested, one player should move on to the left. Now, is this a natural equilibrium? No. Okay, and this? Because goes to to the left. Yeah, very good. So we get this, and now it is a Nash equilibrium, correct? So what you have seen, it was an instance of an example of a best response dynamics done in picture. And we ended up in Nash equilibrium. Now it is not accidental. Even if you did this game on the map of Poland, then it would always terminate. And why? Because it turns out that this game has a potential. So not even ordina generalized ordinal potential, a potential. And this is not so immediate, but uh, one can intuitively explain it using this example. So I will study this example for uh, one, two minutes more and then we'll give you a general argument. So the uh, theorem was established by Rosenthal and it says that every congestion game in its most general form has a potential. And I will give you first an example proof uh, 
by explaining to you how the potential is defined. Regrettably, this picture now is small, but it is one of these previous pictures. On the left, there is one uh, driver in the middle, two on the right-hand side, two. So the idea of the potential is that you calculate so-called accumulated delay. And the accumulated delay is as follows. You take a facility, like the road on the left, you look how many players are there, one. So what is his delay? One. This is for this first uh, at the bottom, one for left road. In the middle, you have two players. So the first one incurs delay one, because we just think uh, nobody else exists. The second one already incurs delay four. So I count one and four, and this is the, what the middle road gives us. On the right-hand side, we also have two players. So for the first one, we count delay as if it was one player, and for the second, five, because the delays are there one, five, six. So it means for this joint strategy of these five players, the potential uh, yields so defined yields 12. Okay, so now we change this uh, potent uh, we change sorry this joint strategy by telling one of the players to move from the right to the left. Correct? Uh, if you can see those dots. Now we count now the uh, what is this accumulated delay. So the accumulated delay now is, I can do it, uh, let's say, without writing. For this new situation which is the bot at the bottom, we now have on the left, we have one plus two, so it's three until now. Now the middle road is one plus four, so I now have five uh, plus three, which is eight. And now also there is one person left on the right-hand road, so it becomes nine, correct? Now, what happened? We now uh, found that the potential dropped from 12 to nine. But what changed here? The player who switched, it is the player on the right-hand side, he switched from this right road to the left road. How much did he gain? Remember, on the right uh, road, it was 156. I will go back here. Here it's slightly bigger. So, on the right road, it was 156. On the left, it's 125. So, how much did this player who changed from the right road to the left gain? Three. Strange. Also three. It's, uh, how come? Because that's the proof. Because the proof is the following that the general argument is you count the accumulated delay. So for every facility which is chosen, so for every J which is in the sets which people chose because they choose sets of facilities, you choose such a J and you check how many users in this joint strategy used it, like two or one in the previous example, and you count this accumulated delay like here, DJ from one, plus DJ plus two, plus blah, blah, DJ till the number of users of this facility J in this joint strategy. And it turns out that this is a potential, and it is a, a very elegant argument. The intuition which I gave you is absolutely sufficient to understand what happens. If one person changes, a strategy, then this potential exactly tracks how much he gains. So this proves that this game has always a Nash equilibrium. Because before we stated that every game which has potential has a Nash equilibrium. So it is also a most elegant way to show that this game has always a Nash equilibrium. And it is not so simple to prove it differently. So, uh, you should remember that these roads were here very trivial. They co consisted of one edge. But this does not have to be so. So, consider another example. So, 
I try to look at it as follows, that there are four cities, on the left it's Amsterdam, on the right is Brussels, and you can reach uh, Brussels either driving through Utrecht, so it's this U, or through Rotterdam. And uh, this is a network of the roads, and I defined a congestion game for 4,000 players, uh, drivers. So they drive from A to B. In short, they, each of them has two strategies, either to drive through Utrecht or to drive through Rotterdam. So each of them has two strategies. I still have to say what is the delay function. So on some segments, this is such a broad highway that it doesn't matter how many people drive. On the other, it depends on the number of users. So from Amsterdam to Utrecht, the delay will be number of drivers who chose it divided by 100. And from Utrecht to, uh, to um, Brussels, it will be 45 minutes. These are not realistic numbers, but it doesn't matter. At the bottom, it's the other way around. From Amsterdam to Rotterdam, it is always 45. But if you drive faster from Rotterdam to Brussels, then it is similar as before. Number of players divided by 100. An example, suppose that everybody drives through Utrecht. So what will be the delay for everybody? Sorry? 85, yes. Because then we will get um, uh, that it will be x will be 4,000. So divided by 100 is 40 plus 45, 85. So the, you understand uh, the... So what's the Nash equilibrium here? Sorry? I don't hear you. Half, 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 half. Yes, half, half, half. <laughs> yes. So, uh, correct. Uh, so, how many Nash equilibria are there here? One or more? No. Th this is an example. You don't know which 2,000 drive. So, you have to pick up 2,000. So, there are many Nash equilibria, okay? But all of them have the same shape. And uh, what is the delay in a Nash equilibrium? Excellent. Okay, so now uh, suppose that uh, people want to improve this infrastructure and they say, well, we should build a new road because we should improve the traffic. So, uh, this is what you solved. So, now we say, uh, we add a new road, just to make it simple, you, uh, delay is zero. Uh, on an exam, I give a question, what is the highest natural number you can put there that you still see this, what will be explained now, uh, brass paradox. Uh, the answer is five, but uh, in short, the zero is to keep things simple. So we add a new road, super fast road, from U to R. So now the players have three strategies, correct? They can go as before and also make a zigzag road. So we have a new game in which each of those 4,000 players has now three strategies. So what is the Nash equilibrium in this game? Sorry? Yes. Yes. So now, uh, the only, so this new uh, strategy turns out to be uh, a strategy which is always better for everybody. So let us count the, let, uh, so uh, let us first understand why it is so. It is simply that if you don't uh, choose this road, it will be always better for you to switch to it. So this best response dynamics will always bring everybody to the zigzag. You want to check? It's very easy to see. Because suppose that for, uh, suppose there are two options, but suppose that somebody chose the AUB road, then his delay is x divided by 100 plus 45. But if he uh, goes down, then, his, uh, then he should choose, um, uh, sorry, then he would choose the x divided by uh, AU, UR, and RB, 
So instead of going from Utrecht to Brussels, he incurs the delay 45. He should go always through Rotterdam because the maximum delay will be 40. So everybody makes the same reasoning, and as a result, it will be the only strategy which will be a best response to a player, so everybody moves to this. So what is now the delay? So uh, now it turns out that the delay is 80. Because if everybody goes by zigzag, then he will incur the delay uh, 40 from Amsterdam to Utrecht and then 40 from Rotterdam to Brussels. So what happened? We added a new road. We apparently aimed at improving the traffic and we ended up that things got worse. So this is called Brass Paradox. So you have a congestion game and you add a new road and uh, people end up in a different Nash equilibrium, which is worse off. And it is a problem because we would think that if you improve infrastructure, you improve, uh, let's say, situation for people involved. It is not so. And you can ask yourself, does this make sense? Does it happen? Well, I encourage you to go to Wikipedia. I uh, copied this a, really a couple of years ago. Probably there are even more examples. There are several examples which are cited where it did appear. And the most famous example is uh, in Manhattan, in New York, and it was even described in a article in a science section of New York Times with the title, What if the 42, 42nd Street were closed and nobody noticed? Now, Manhattan, uh, perhaps you don't know, looks like this, roughly. And there is a very important 42nd Street. Do you know that it's important or not? United Nations is, on, for example, on, located on 42nd Street. It's a very important cross street. And indeed, a large part of it was closed for works. And people noticed that the traffic got faster because of this. Because it turned out, probably, that before these repairs, everybody was going through this 42 Street, 42nd, and it caused additional delays. So when they closed this, the traffic got better. And there were other examples where people noticed this. And when I gave this lecture once uh, uh, during my course on game theory in Amsterdam, then some student came uh, next time and she said, yeah, I talked with my mom about this and she just said something similar, that a ring road around Amsterdam had one fragment closed and she actually was driving faster thanks to this. So it is not something which is completely uh, absurd, but there is a very important message here, namely that you cannot improve things by just throwing more money. You have to know what you are doing, so this is one. The other is that it is not so simple to improve the situation, and the third message is that it is better that there is some supervisor and you don't let people do exactly what they want. Because if you let people do what they want, they choose zigzag. But this road is an improvement. You just have to regulate. You have to say part of people go this way, part of this, that way. And when you streamline, then people will get better off. So this brings us to a topic which I'll discuss in a moment, which is called price of anarchy. But uh, this is useful to understand that this brass paradox illustrates a number of problems which naturally arise and we can also quantify them. And uh, it is sometimes a pity that politicians don't know the simple things and they make, uh, let's say, spend public money on wrong investments. Now, uh, to measure this loss of efficiency, people introduced a concept which has a very catchy name, pri price of anarchy. And the idea is very simple. You compare what is the loss of efficiency between two situations. One is that somebody from the top regulates who 
is to do what? So then such a person naturally will say uh, we aim at social optimum or you just don't intervene, you let people, so to say, find their own way and this way they will end up in some Nash equilibrium. So price of anarchy measures this loss of efficiency in terms of proportion in under the assumption that people will end up in the worst Nash equilibrium because games in general will have several Nash equilibria. So for a given game G, we have this, uh, s uh, this uh, quotient uh, expressed in social welfare. Uh, so the sum of payoffs, as you remember. And this, uh, this quotient captures uh, the difference between uh, uh, the social welfare in social optimum and a worst Nash equilibrium. That's why we take this supremum. So, uh, of course, there can be situations that the games have no Nash equilibria or uh, things are infinite, or, but we assume that if there is no Nash equilibrium, then this price of efficiency by definition is infinity, just to keep it simple. So if you have a class of games like congestion games, it was not one game, it was a whole class of games, then you define for such a, a class of games the concept of price of anarchy by taking the worst uh, possible instance of it. So you take the supremum second time. So this was proposed some 15 years ago and people started to study this for several games. We could do this for the games I discussed yesterday, but this I'll do after the break in context of another concept. Uh, because it has nothing to do with congestion games and it has to do with every game where there is a discrepancy between social optimum and Nash equilibrium. So uh, there is an important result which shows that one can prove uh, these things, uh, that there is, uh, the price of anarchy sometimes can be very simple. And uh, there is uh, a class of games, uh, affine congestion games, in which delay functions are expressed in such a linear expression. Now, uh, this, what we studied in Brass Paradox, is a typical example, because there this delay was like x divided by 100, so it is x times a rational number, yes? So these delay functions uh, of Brass Paradox are uh, here uh, properly, uh, let's say, covered. And Christodoulou and Kutsupias proved in 2005 that price of anarchy for these games is 5 over 2. Now, let us go back to the example, just to understand what was the loss here. Here, the loss was that in the only Nash equilibrium, or sorry, in the only in terms of a shape, Nash equilibrium, the uh, delay was 65. And uh, when this road was added, it was 80. Now, uh, what does this mean? Uh, it is a different story because here we compare two different games, correct? So uh, we should look at the game in which this road is added. So in this game, the Nash equilibrium, the only one, is everybody chooses zigzag. So uh, the social welfare is 80 times the number of players, correct? Uh, this, uh, sorry, not social. Uh, yeah, social welfare of the Nash equilibrium. And what is the, uh, in this game, the social optimum? Because we talked uh, until now only about Nash equilibrium. What would be best for the society? Let's say we ended up that in Nash equilibrium, everybody's uh, delay is 80. What could be the best here? Sorry? 65, yes, still. So this road U to R is really useless. And so the loss of efficiency is here 80 divided by 65. So this result of Kutsupias and Christodoulou says that there are games for which it can be as much as two, 
and half, but not more. So this quantifies this change and shows it can be that much, but not more. So these are very elegant results. Uh, I do not have time to discuss the proof. The proof is in the lecture notes. And uh, the first step of the proof is to simplify the delay function and transform every affine congestion gain to a gain which is even simpler, where every delay function is just identity. So if there are five players, the delay is five, etc. And uh, after this, then the rest is essentially a simple proof with some small combinatorial lemma. Uh, so it is, let's say, something which can be easily explained and it does not require uh, very advanced uh, reasoning and that's what makes this area so attractive. So what happens is that there are by now hundreds of papers on price of anarchy because you can take any game in which you study this. And for some games, it's very difficult. Like if you uh, choose arbitrary congestion games, then there are some bounds and people still could not prove that it's optimal and so on. So it is a very uh, large area. And in this area, there are several results which are partial. And uh, it is really, I know people who have written 15 papers, and they are only about price of anarchy. So it becomes so specialized. And the flavor is that, uh, of this research is that you, for specific games, know exactly what is the loss of efficiency. So I will now move on to a different uh, way of measuring inefficiency, which, which was proposed uh, a bit later than price of anarchy, which is called price of stability. And price of stability is very similar, but you take an optimistic assumption. You say that the users end up in the best Nash equilibrium. So you compute this loss of efficiency with respect to this optimistic scenario. So you take here in this, uh, uh, in this uh, quotient uh, as before a Nash equilibrium, but now you don't take supremum, but infinum. So you take the smallest um, uh, quotient, that is to say you search for a best Nash equilibrium. And then price of stability is defined uh, as the worth of such best uh, uh, quotients. So in a different paper, Christodoulou and Kutsupias proved that for these games, this uh, uh, price of uh, stability is smaller or equal than two. So it's, there are more uh, Nash equilibria in general. Here it was very simplified setup, so there were only or, uh, more, more types, I should say. And here there was only one type of Nash equilibria. So uh, this is not optimal. And people kept improving this, and there is now current bound 1, 5, 7, etc. And this is really not simple to improve such results. Uh, so it becomes very um, elaborate and one studies very specific games. It is a very long story. So now I will uh, provide you with a special case of congestion games, which are called fair cost sharing games. So fair cost sharing games have the property that the uh, price, or uh, sorry, the delay, think of it that you don't uh, incur delay, but you have to pay for travel. But the payment is uh, for a road segment is fixed. And you just uh, divide it by the number of users. And this is called fair cost sharing. So. Uh, Everybody chooses some road, and suppose that you look at some segment and you wonder, how much should I pay for it? Well, you pick up from the shelf the cost for this segment, you check how many people happened to uh, select this segment, and you divide for each user, uh, you make uh, this segment divided by number of users. And once you have this, it is one of the turns which enters the cost of the whole road. 
because the road consists of segments. So uh, this is uh, therefore assumed that each facility is evenly shared. So here is the summary of this cost function that for each uh, strategy, which will be a selection of such uh, segments, you check what is the cost of this segment, which is fixed, CJ, and you divide it by the number of users. And you remember this function UJ from joint strategy counted how many people in their strategy chose in particular this uh, um, facility, uh, this uh, specific road segment J. It is very easy to show some examples. So here you have, for instance, uh, some very simple graph and you have two drivers uh, of trucks, say, and they start at the location called begin and one wants to reach dep depot one and the other depot two. So there are uh, in total uh, three roads which read, uh, lead there. So suppose that one of them chooses the road on the right, uh, which is uh, incurs for him delay eight and the other one chooses the road on the left and it incurs him delay uh, four. Is this a Nash equilibrium? No. And why? Uh, which one? Yeah, yes. So he should choose to the middle road and his delay will be six, correct? Um, is this then a Nash equilibrium? No, Bec the other one can also move there. So now we have a Nash equilibrium. The costs, uh, how much is the cost for the last uh, driver? Or for both of them, sorry. Three and a half, correct. Because they, uh, uh, one of them will go to the left afterwards and the other to the right and they share this segment. So uh, you saw that this was very important in what order this change took place because uh, from this uh, situation the leftmost driver could not move to the middle, correct? He uh, could do it only after the other one moved. No, so, so such situations uh, become indeed possible. Uh, now you have uh, another problem. Uh, suppose that th there are two roads and again two drivers. And uh, is there a Nash So each of the driver has to choose a road. So there are two Nash equilibria. Do you agree? Uh, who is talking? Oh, you, yes. And you are right. Because if one player chooses the left road, then it's always better for the other one to choose. That's easy because it's two. But if uh, one player chooses the rightmost road, then for the other one, it's always better to choose there. So there are two Nash equilibria, correct? So this is a simplest example of a congestion game with two Nash equilibria, okay? But uh, this one is another example which may be of interest to you. Namely, here there is only... Sorry? Sorry, this... Okay. Before? Uh, no, the problem is... Yeah. Uh, I forgot to put arrows here. This rightmost player has to reach the depot too. So he has to, he cannot sort of go around. His way is either directly or in the middle and then turn right. So there is here, uh, the, the lack of arrows causes uh, confusion. So the rightmost player has two strategies, the other one also two but uh, the strategies overlap only on this segment. The other one is private, so to say. Uh, okay, so this is another example. Uh, 
again under the same assumptions of this uh, possible strategy. So uh, here, uh, this what we have now is not uh, a, is not a Nash equilibrium. We saw it before, but. Um, um, uh, I'm sorry, now the numbers are different, yes. So now this is a Nash equilibrium uh, because uh, the player uh, who would like to change, like the right uh, most player, if he moved to the middle road, he would travel six units. The same with the left most, so none of them gets better off. So it is a Nash equilibrium, but it's better for both players if they choose together the middle segment, because then they share it. You just have to count the number of uh, the, the numbers associated with selected segments. So then they go through the middle and then left and right. So the total delay would be seven. So here we have a situation that there exists a discrepancy between. Nash equilibrium and social optimum. And you cannot, so to say, tell, uh, listen, uh, you have to change because if a person changes, he cannot, uh, let's say, tell the other one to change. It's uh, not in the definition of Nash equilibrium. So I will now uh, give you an example, a simple one, how to compute price of stability so that you see what type of arguments are used. And this will give you an idea uh, what type of problems one has to solve. So suppose for the sake of this uh, simple example that there is an even number of uh, players, drivers, and there are two roads from A to B. And on the top, the road uh, from A to B always uh, leads to a delay N, which is the number of players. But on the bottom, the delay is the number of users. So if, for example, the top is uh, chosen by uh, n minus 2 uh, players, then all of them incur delay n. But the remaining two choose the bottom road, and each of them incurs a delay 2. Okay? So this game, one can quickly uh, check, has two Nash equilibria. One is that there is only one player who chooses the top road, and n minus one players chooses the bottom road. Do you agree that this is a Nash equilibrium? So the people on the bottom get delay n minus one. So you might think that the one on the top uh, should switch. But if he switches, then there are at that moment n players and the delay will be n, so he won't get better off. So it is a Nash equilibrium. The other Nash equilibrium is that at the top nobody chooses it and at the bottom everybody chooses and then everybody has delay n. So we have two Nash equilibria and we can easily calculate the social cost, the, uh, accumulate, yes. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, two types of Nash equilibria, you are right. Because uh, indeed, when we select one player, then we don't say which one. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, two types. Let's say that I forgot a word there. So, two types of Nash equilibria, but indeed, you are right, uh, n plus one Nash equilibria. So, uh, the social costs are computed by adding the delays. So now, what is the uh, so which uh, Nash equilibrium is better uh, in terms of social delay? The one with one and n minus one, yes. But what is the social optimum here? So we can solve a very simple problem. Take a function. We don't know how many uh, uh, drivers put on the top road. Suppose that it's x and we compute what's the resulting social uh, welfare in this case, so social cost. So we get this function f, which tells us uh, that the social cost will be x times x, because there will be x uh, drivers on the top. For each of them, he delay, uh, his uh, 
uh, delay is x, so we have x times x. The remaining ones go at the bottom, so this is n minus x, and this, all of them incur delay n, so we just add it up and we get this function. And we want to find a minimum, so it becomes now the sort of elementary calculus. So we have this function here, uh, the function, uh, quadratic function in x, we compute the first uh, derivative uh, equated to zero, and we get nothing surprising that it should be half. Okay, so we computed the social optimum. So for this game, we can now compare the uh, cost in the social optimum with respect to the cost in the best Nash equilibrium. We are interested in price of stability. So this is here. So we have uh, these two costs and we divide it and we obtain in this case this uh, number. And we can see that here it is uh, some expression which uh, is um, a fraction in uh, at the bottom is n square. Uh, so this, uh, when n goes to infinity, it converges to one. So we can say that the price of stability of this example, if we take go into the limit, is four over three. So it gives you some kind of idea how to approach such problems and how to solve them. But uh, I sort of imper uh, in implicitly started to move into a certain uh, issue which I did not discuss, because I told you for congestion games, what is the price of anarchy, what is the price of stability, but I'm now talking about a very special case of congestion games, fair cost-sharing games where these uh, delays were gen computed by taking uh, for each road segment a fixed delay and divided it, uh, dividing it evenly over the number of users. So, essentially, the question now is, what is the uh, price of stability of fair cost-sharing games? Now, this turns out to uh, have been also studied and answered, and it is re related to harmonic numbers. So, a small reminder in case you forgot. So, harmonic number is the sum, uh, n's harmonic number is the sum of the fractions 1 plus half plus one third, and so forth, uh, n time, n, uh, let's say, terms. And this is a number which goes very slowly to infinity. And this was first proven by some uh, Bel uh, French monk, uh, Nicolas Oresme, in 1350. And it was forgotten, and then uh, Euler uh, and uh, brothers Bernoulli started to study such infinite sequences in 18th century, and they uh, were not aware that uh, at that time, as you remember, internet did not exist. So uh, they uh, proved actually stronger results. And in particular, Euler, just uh, it's useful to remember, he compared the slow growth of this function to the growth of log a natural log logarithm, and he actually showed that the difference uh, converges to a certain number, and this is called gamma, this number, it's uh, Euler's constant, and until now it is not known whether it is a rational or irrational number, it's zero, five, something. But anyway, uh, this, uh, and th the proof of uh, this is very beautiful, it's really uh, something which, uh, let's say, is ideal for secondary school. Uh, because it's just very simple manipulations on infinite sequences. Uh, if you don't remember the proof, I really recommend that you just look in Wikipedia. It's, uh, now, what is the relevance of this to us? The relevance is that uh, in 2004, uh, people uh, established what is the price of stability for those 
uh, games, uh, the fair cost uh, sharing games. And it turns out that this is not, it is for each n a finite number, but this number slowly grows. It is simply harmonic number, n's harmonic number. And uh, the proof is again in lecture notes, and also there is some nice example shows that it is exactly this. But again, I just drop it due to time uh, limi uh, limitation, and uh, it just shows uh, a different phenomenon, that there are games or classes of games for which the uh, price, in this case, stability is finite, but it depends on the number of players, and if the number of players goes to infinity, then this price goes also to infinity, and this was a different uh, story here. Here at this last bullet, when the number of players went to infinity, then this actually converged to a finite number. So this was by no means a typical example. Okay, so I think I finished this part. So let me try to summarize that you sort of, it's called in English a take home message. So my intention was, as the title indicated, to study congestion games. But to study them in a meaningful way, you need some minimum tools. And the first tool is a potential. Potential, if a game has it, it's very important, you can they immediately prove that it has a Nash equilibrium. Uh, these games, congestion games, have a potential. It's not a very simple one, but it can be with some effort explained. This was the result of Rosenthal, this accumulated delay. Uh, this was one. Uh, the best response dynamics is a naive procedure, but it works in case the game has potential. Then it uh, always terminates. Additionally, we studied or discussed the brass paradox, which showed that it is not the case that if you improve the infrastructure, the results are better. And uh, to measure what goes wrong in such situations, we introduced this price of anarchy and price of stability. And we, at least I indicated that for certain classes of games, namely for affine uh, congestion games and for fair cost sharing games, these results uh, can be quantified very precisely. Uh, after the break, I will present an alternative approach uh, to this measuring this loss of efficiency, which will provide some different perspective at these uh, matters, and then you can get a kind of stereo picture of these matters. If you have only one approach to study inefficiency, you just think that's how it should be approached. But it is not so. There can be other ways. So I guess it's a good moment to have coffee, uh, to which uh, I invite you. <laughs> we resume. So I discussed uh, before the break two concepts, which, are, which were uh, introduced to measure the inefficiency uh, of solutions uh, in game theory. Now, you should also realize that there are more than uh, one notion of equilibrium. In Nash equilibrium, for example, we focus only on a player who may change his strategy, because we say, are you satisfied? And if a player says no, then uh, he changes and so on. But you can also ask a group of people. And then this is called a uh, strong uh, equilibrium. You can also have another notion that you say, okay, we just choose some epsilon and we say that is everybody satisfied up to epsilon? And uh, this leads to a notion of epsilon Nash equilibrium. So there are many concepts which uh, fall under the category of an equilibrium. You can also have an equilibrium in mixed strategies. And then uh, the set of uh, Nash equilibria and mixed strategies is in general larger than the set of Nash equilibria and the original strategies. So for each type of solution concept, you may have a different notion of a price of stability or price of anarchy. So this is more to indicate to you a direction in which such research continues. 
Now, in the remaining time today, I'll discuss a different approach, which we called selfishness level. And as usual, we start with, uh, uh, with prisoner's dilemma, but first I will introduce a concept of altruistic games. Now, in the original setup, people are very egoistic. They only think what is good for them because this payoff function does not take into account what the others get. But we can link those players in some sense by choosing some number, preferably a small number, and modify the payoff as follows. We take the original payoff in the game and we add to the payoff alpha times the social welfare of this whole uh, joint strategy which was considered. And this yields a notion of an altruistic gain. So here we have an altruistic gain which is obtained by adding alpha times social welfare. So here is the modified definition. So we first have the original game and now we modify it by changing only the payoff functions. We link those people, those players, by making their payoff also dependent on what the others got in some cumulative sense. So if you put alpha zero, you get, of course, the original game, and you ideally want to have such alpha chosen in a meaningful way. Now, what is the purpose of it? The purpose is to eliminate this discrepancy between social welfare in an optimum, in a social optimum and in a Nash equilibrium. So we want to modify this game by this uh, factor alpha in such a way that a Nash equilibrium will also become a social optimum. And if we succeed, then we say that game is alpha selfish. So G is, by definition, I repeat, alpha selfish. If in this transformed game there exists a Nash equilibrium, which is also in this transformed game a social optimum. And now we want to make this change at the smallest cost. So we choose the smallest alpha for which this can be achieved. There are two small pitfalls. One is that this set does not need to have a minimum, so we take infinim, infinum, and additionally, this set can be empty, because it can happen, you will easily see matching penis is an example, no way you change the game, you, don't solve the, you, uh, you cannot solve the problem. So as a result, you uh, have to be prepared for such situations. So for this, we stipulate that infinitum of an empty set of the empty set is infinity. And uh, there is another problem that you take this infinitum, infinitum, and then you have the following problem: that you reached a number for which the game is not alpha selfish, but it's alpha selfish for every bigger one. So that the set of alphas for which the game is alpha selfish is uh, not um, uh, its uh, open uh, interval at the left end. So then we just stipulate that it's alpha plus. It is not alpha, but alpha plus. We look for the smallest such number. It is a kind of... Uh, rare situation. In all natural examples, it doesn't appear. So this plus is just to cover all cases. So what is the idea? We have a game. We want to change it into another game where there is no discrepancy, where in, in the vocabulary of the previous lecture, the price of stability is one. And we seek the smallest such alpha. So here is the uh, intuition. So the selfishness level is the minimal share of social welfare which you have to use to induce the players that they choose a social optimum. And this is what we'll discuss during this lecture. So just to give you an idea what is the difference between this approach and the approach between uh, the break. So 
there are good words for it, which also incidentally people use in economy, which is um, one is normative and the other is descriptive. So imagine, forget economy, forget computer science. Suppose a patient comes to a doctor and the doctor says, I'm sorry, you are sick, you have this and this uh, sickness, and the patient say, good, thank you, goodbye. Now, would you be satisfied with this kind of interaction? It doesn't make sense, but what is the point? This is declarative. The doctor declared that you are sick. What you expect is that the doctor would say, I'm sorry you are sick, and here is the medicine which can help you uh, to overcome your disease or some treatment. So the latter is called normative. So this is the difference between declarative and normative. Normative says what to do, and declarative says what is going on. So before the break, these approaches were declarative. There was a game and we said, this game has this problem. And here is the number which quantifies the problem. Here we say, this game has a problem and this is the way we want to solve it. So this is a normative approach. And this approach is also qualitative because we want to find the smallest alpha. So the whole lecture is this, uh, devoted to discuss the smallest alpha in many cases and to understand whether this approach yields some interesting results. So, as usual, we go back to those three examples and let us, uh, by way of example, try to compute the uh, selfishness level of prisoner's dilemma. You remember that this was a pr the first example of a game where social well optimum and Nash equilibrium differed. Uh, so what is the price of anarchy of this prisoner's dilemma? Just that you are with me on the same page. Two, yes. It's four plus four divided by one plus one, correct? because we divide the uh, social welfare in the optimum by the social welfare in the worst, in this case, the only Nash equilibrium. Okay, so now in prisoner's dilemma, the selfishness level is one. Now, how to see it? Look, I change this prisoner's dilemma to the version where I add to each player one times social welfare. So let's see how I got this game on the right. Take CC. There, the social welfare is four. So I added four to payoffs of both players. So I got six, six. Similarly with CD, it is 0, 0,3. So the social welfare is three. So I add three and I ended up with three, six. And similarly with the other ones. Yes, is it clear? So I just go back quickly to the definition that you will see what we had here. We are now uh, defining the altruistic version of the prisoner's dilemma for alpha equals one. So we got this game and now let us check if in this game there is still this paradox, this prisoner's dilemma. What is the Nash equilibrium of this game or N Nash equilibrium? Any suggestions? Sorry? CC. So, uh, why is it so? Well, the shortcut is nobody gets better than six. So, it's obvious if both of them get six, then it is Nash equilibrium. And also, it's the only Nash equilibrium, incidentally. Yes, because everybody can switch to get six. So, uh, this is a Nash equilibrium. Also, it's a social optimum. So, in this uh, transformed game, there is no problem anymore. And you can easily check, it is in the lecture notes, or, in, sorry, CD is a CD. Yes, you are right. Yes, I'm sorry, you are right, correct. 
So uh, CD and DC are also Nash equilibria, uh, correct, sorry, I take it back. But uh, we are uh, fortunately considering the best Nash equilibrium. So in the best Nash equilibrium there is no problem, it's also a social optimum. So I was too fast. So we solve this discrepancy and one can check easily that one is the smallest number for which you solve this, pro uh, this discrepancy. So one can therefore uh, check, it's very easy, uh, conclusion is selfishness level is one. You have to add one unit of social welfare to everybody. Now, in battle of sexes there is no problem because the original Nash equilibria are also social optima, so you don't need to change anything, it's zero. Now, why the selfishness level of matching penis is infinity. Is there some simple way to explain it? In short, you can't do it. Sorry? I don't hear you. Excellent. So whatever alpha you take, you just don't change the game. G alpha for this game is always the same game. So you don't solve this problem you don't get a Nash equilibrium, so you don't satisfy this condition that you have a Nash equilibrium, which is also social welfare. Now, there, is, uh, there are more examples. This is this game with bad Nash equilibrium, this matching pennies with these edge uh, strategies. The right bottom corner is the only Nash equilibrium. And in this game, you again cannot change uh, things for better. The problem is, again, as you notice, that for this uh, corner, this HT, this uh, four uh, square at the top left, uh, you have social welfare zero. So you never get above this. And in the other squares, it's even negative. So you only get worse if you add uh, the uh, some fraction of social welfare, so you never reach a situation that this Nash equilibrium will become also social optimum, and uh, you cannot solve the problem. So it is just to give you an idea of all possible variations. Now there is another uh, unusual situation which appears now. Consider the game on the left. You can check that it has no Nash equilibrium. In particular, uh, CC is not a Nash equilibrium because the first player can switch to D and he gets a 3. Now, if we uh, compute the altruistic version with alpha equal 1, then we get the game on the right. So, we, for example, for CC we added 4 uh, to each of them. And suddenly this game has a Nash equilibrium and moreover, this Nash, uh, there is a Nash equilibrium which is also social optimum. So, even though the original game had no Nash equilibrium, the transformed one has, and uh, consequently, the original game, by definition, uh, is, um, is. So, we know that the selfishness level of this original game is one or less. Now, less does not work, you can quickly check, and as a result, the conclusion is this game has no Nash equilibrium, but still it has a selfishness level one. So, if you apply to this game on the left uh, some reasoning uh, based on price of anarchy, on price of stability, you get really no information, you just get answer infinity. And, of course, for matching pennies, the same. So, this approach provides uh, some handle and some number. And uh, this number, uh, you can wonder, suppose that you arrange this payoff, so you are the organizer of the game, and therefore uh, you are interested to choose alpha as small as possible because you pay from your own pocket for these payoffs. So then you can ask yourself where to find this money. So there is a way to do it, because you can simply, in the definition of this altruistic game, uh, you can 
just calibrate it and you can assume, okay, for this joint strategy, I have this budget. The budget is the social welfare. Now I exceeded this by adding this alpha times social welfare, but okay, so I'll just divide it so that it becomes the original one. So you can adjust these numbers so that per entry, per joint strategy, the uh, overall payoff, so the social welfare will remain the same. So there is a way to uh, somehow counter this criticism. So now we have uh, this notion and we moved to um, this uh, uh, games which have no Nash equilibria, but uh, they can be transformed to a game with a Nash equilibrium. Now just to compare uh, how these two notions relate to each other, selfishness level and price of stability. So you remember from previous lecture, uh, price of stability was the quotient uh, social welfare in social optimum divided by social welfare in a best uh, Nash equilibrium uh, with, high, with the highest social welfare. So if the selfishness level is zero, then it's exactly another way to say that the price of stability is one. So you would think that these two notions are somehow related, but it is not so, because you can prove that for every pair of numbers, alpha and beta, you can find a game such that its selfishness uh, level is alpha and price of stability is beta. So these things are totally unrelated. And the proof is really simple. One uh, constructs a kind of variant of a prisoner's dilemma with carefully chosen numbers. So uh, you should look at this game, G, and note the following, that the CC is the unique uh, social optimum, uh, where the social welfare is two. In both uh, these uh, fractions are chosen in such a way that it will not add up to two. Now, suppose that we transform this game by, now it's a temporary number, so I don't choose it. Uh, alpha and beta are given, so now I choose gamma. And uh, suppose that in this transformed game, CC is a Nash equilibrium. In the original game, it is not, because, for example, player uh, one, so the row player can go down to D, and then he has more than one as a payoff. But suppose that we found such gamma that it is the case, then we end up with some very simple inequality, and this inequality is written here, and you can just easily check that this is the same as saying that this gamma is at least alpha. So you resolve this problem by choosing any gamma bigger or equal than alpha. So the conclusion is, it's all really simple calculations, that the selfishness level of this game is alpha. However, the price of stability of this game is beta. Why? Because here the, it is a kind of prisoner's dilemma, so the only Nash equilibrium is DD with the social welfare two, times, uh, two divided by beta, whereas the social optimum is two, and if you divide it, you get beta. So the conclusion is these two notions are unrelated. And now we have to understand what type of intuitions the selfishness level provides us. So I will now go through a number of examples and then we will think, uh, we will uh, consider what is the hidden message behind it and what can we conclude with this. Because after all, I was talking about the normative approach, so it is supposed to convey some message. So. Uh, how to compute the social, uh, the um, uh, selfishness level is uh, the first question, and how to understand when a game has a finite social, uh, I'm sorry, a finite uh, selfishness level. So it turns out that a crucial notion is something which is called a stable social optimum. So among social optima, you choose a certain subset. And a stable social optimum is characterized by the following feature. Uh, it does not have to be Nash equilibrium. So if somebody profitably 
uh, deviates from it, everything fine. But now we add a condition. In that case, uh, the game cannot move to another social optimum. So this is the definition. A social optimum is stable if no player is better off if you move to another social optimum. Or in other words, if a player is better off, then the new situation is not a social optimum. And there is uh, here just a, a line which uh, says it in a slightly more formal way. And uh, one thing is uh, obvious that if there is a unique social optimum, then of course it's stable because it's uh, the definition is void, but the social optima in finite games always exist, but uh, stable not. For example, in matching penny, each uh, entry is a social optimum, but none of them is stable, because if a player switches, he switches to another joint strategy, which is also social optimum, which contradicts the definition of stable social optimum. And it provides a clue. If a game has a stable social optimum, then its uh, selfishness level turns out to be finite. Now, this is an instance of a more general result. So we want to compute the selfishness level. And the, the way to do it is to introduce an auxiliary notion which we call appeal factor. So suppose we have a joint strategy and we focus on player I. And for player I, he can consider various strategies. But some strategies can be better off in the original game, some worse. But now he is to already be somehow studied from the viewpoint of this altruistic game. So Suppose that the player moves, uh, player i moves from strategy S i to S prime i. Then above the bar we have the difference. Suppose that it's a gain which he achieves, but this gain is now uh, has to be compared with the loss of social welfare which his decision takes. If this quotient is very big, then intuitively this strategy is interesting for him, even in this altruistic game. So if we can bound this appeal factor, then it turns out that the selfishness level is finite. And this is exactly the uh, contents of this first bullet in this result, that the selfishness is finite if such uh, appeal factor analysis focused only on social, stable social optima yields in all cases a bounded number. So we consider the profitable deviations for each player from a stable social uh, optimum. We check this uh, FI, this appeal factor, and we try to make it as big as possible. If it turns out to be bounded, the conclusion is that the selfishness level is finite. So this also allows us to compute it. So we have to take all set, the set of all stable social optima. For each of them, compute this maximum of this uh, appeal factor. And we assume it's finite, and this really this maximum is the social is the uh, selfishness level. Now, uh, this is just to show you that using the concepts which we introduce, so change of strategy, social welfare, you can and social optima, you can easily concoct a formula how to compute for a given game its uh, self selfishness level and additionally to determine that it is finite. So, uh, some observations. If the game, uh, the previous slide did not assume that the game is finite, but if the game uh, is finite and uh, its uh, social, uh, the selfishness level is finite, then it is equivalent to the fact that the game has a stable social optimum. So, uh, if you have a game and you want to figure out does it have a finite 
selfishness level, then a way to do it is to identify all social stable uh, optima, socially stable optima, and uh, just uh, figure out that this set is not uh, empty. So, in matching pennies, you, we had uh, there were no stable social optima. Now, if the game has only one uh, social optimum, a unique one, then of course it is stable because the definition of stable uh, social optimum referred to other uh, social optima. There is only one, so you, cannot, you can never deviate to another one. So a game with such a unique social optimum has by definition a finite level, a uh, selfishness level which is finite. Now this previous formula, which is uh, in the second uh, bullet, uh, looks very elaborate, but this is in general the only way to proceed. So in all examples which I'll discuss uh, from now on, we compute the selfishness level by laboriously studying this procedure. So first identifying the set of stable social optima and for each of them computing this appeal factor and analyzing what happens with this. So now I will proceed through uh, various examples. Uh, so first, as usual, let us go back to prisoner's dilemma. And now you will see an important difference. Uh, we have uh, a more general version so uh, there it was, uh, there were no benefits and costs of cooperation. Now I introduce parameters which before were one and zero. So uh, now, uh, sorry, one and one before. So now B is cost benef benefit of cooperation. So we multiply this uh, strategies uh, obtained by the others. So the number of those who cooperate by B and we deduct the costs, uh, so to say, of cooperation by multiplying your strategy by, uh, uh, by uh, minus C. So this way we obtain a modified uh, payoff function and uh, this payoff function is more general than before, but it remains prisoner's dilemma with all the same properties as before. And you can calculate using this formula what is the selfishness level of this game and you obtain such an expression. Now, this expression we can now study by analyzing what happens if you change one of its parameters. So first of all, notice that n appears, it is c divided by b times n minus 1 minus c. Now, the exact form of the expression is not so important. What is important is how this expression changes when the parameters change. So suppose that the number of players increases, so n bigger it gets bigger, then the selfishness level gets smaller. So the intuition is that to correct this discrepancy or this dilemma, it is less problematic if there are more players. So this is one of the, so to say, underlying uh, idea. Now, the same is with the benefit. If the benefit grows, then B appears only below the bar. So as a result, the selfishness level goes down, so less effort is needed to, so to say, eliminate this dilemma. So if the benefit of cooperation increases, the kind of acuteness of this prisoner's dilemma phenomenon uh, decreases. And uh, the, uh, this somehow uh, illustrates that you can also quantify using now these parameters how you can uh, manipulate or how you can adjust the uh, degree of this dilemma and what kind of issues can, let's say, have here uh, an effect on, uh, on um, the, let's say, problem of inducing cooperation. So, uh, in case of prisoner's dilemma, I did not, because we did not have then the uh, vocabulary, we did not compute the price of stability, but the price of stability will be 
a specific number, which here uh, for this, uh, I forgot it is in the paper, it does not provide us with any insights uh, what is the uh, what does this mean? Here we have an expression which gives you a much uh, clearer picture. Uh, here is a new game which I did not discuss before. And uh, this game is another instance of this tension between egoistic behavior and what is good for society. It's called public goods game. So the idea is the following. Everybody gets some budget. And now from this budget, he has to decide how much to move to a common pool. And like, for example, to build a school. And this uh, common pool is used to construct some public good. That's why this game is called this way. And this is obtained by multiplying what people put aside by some number bigger than one, which, so to say, indicates that this is the benefit for the society. So we have a multiplier C, bigger than one, and the payoff reflects what I said. So you initially have uh, budget B, which will be your payoff. You lose what you put into the common pool, so minus SI, but what you get back is your share of what is produced with this money from the common pool. So the money which is put aside is sum over all i's of SI. That's what people put aside. This has been multiplied by uh, the um, benefit here at C. And this is redistributed back to everybody. So now this game has a problem that in general uh, with those numbers it is the case that for people it is better to contribute zero. That we say, yeah, let the others pay for the school, but I will send my children there. So this is uh, called free riding in economy. That you free ride on what the others decided and built and you just use the results or you benefit from it. And the purpose of this game is to investigate what to do with this. So it turns out that contributing zero is always a better strategy. I forgot here there is a condition which is in the paper I didn't put on slide that the C should not be too big. It should be smaller or equal than N. So then it is always better to uh, just be egoistic and say I don't contribute. And uh, when we have this selfishness level, which one can compute using this appeal factor, we get a certain expression and we can now look how this expression changes when we change the parameters. So if uh, we fix this multiplier and we increase the number of players, so this expression goes up because C over N goes down, but it is with minus, so it goes up. So this expression goes up with N going up, which in some intuitive sense says that in the bigger group of people, it's somehow mentally for people easier to free ride. They feel less responsible that it's also their moral obligation to contribute. So the selfishness level goes up. You have to correct this gain by uh, higher, uh, let's say, payments to uh, eliminate this desire of people to free ride. But if uh, you fix the number of players and you increase the multiplier, then the benefits of cooperation grow and then it is reflected by noticing that this selfishness level goes down there. So the selfishness level really measures uh, the level you have to adjust the situation to correct it. And the more money you, so to say, have to pump into resolving this uh, egoistic behavior. So here we have a certain type of um, expression which measures things. Now, it turns out that uh, the analysis by price of stability or price of anarchy is here completely 
useless because it turns out that if the c is smaller or equal than n, which I forgot, then uh, everybody chooses zero is a Nash equilibrium. It's a unique Nash equilibrium. Whereas if everybody chooses B, it is the uh, social optimum. And then you get a difference which uh, is an expression uh, which does not uh, provide any reference to the number C and uh, you do not see any dependence on the costs which you or uh, sorry on the uh, level of multiplier you just do not see that it affects uh, things differently uh, okay so now we have the potential games which we studied before the break and this is a general result we want to know whether potential games uh, have a finite selfishness level now, it turns out, so it's a general uh, problem, has nothing to do with some examples. Now, it turns out that uh, every potential game has a finite selfishness level. And the proof is surprisingly simple. Namely, you should remember from a previous slide what was the issue. That we wanted to uh, check that uh, there exists a stable social optimum and uh, the stable social optimum uh, was supposed to be a social optimum from which uh, one can deviate, but one cannot deviate profitably to another social optimum. So there was a condition that if there exists a stable social optimum, then the game has a finite uh, selfishness level. Now, the question is, does there exist a stable social optimum in potential games? In, uh, yes, in potential games. So, the answer is yes. And what happens is that the proof is, uh, you may remember that how did we prove that potential games have a Nash equilibrium? We took a maximum of the potential function because from this maximum nobody could deviate profitably because then potential would go up. Now we use slightly different approach but also play with the potential. You may have several social optima in the game. The game is finite so there exists at least one. Among all those social optima you choose the one with the largest uh, potential. I claim that this is a stable social optimum. Why? Because suppose somebody profitably deviates from it. It cannot be a deviation to a, another social optimum. Why? Because the potential went up and I chose just as the starting point a, a social optimum with the largest potential. So it does not have to be Nash equilibrium. People can deviate profitably, but they will not deviate to another social optimum. In short, if we use the potential to select the social optimum, by uh, it can be done, namely we choose a social optimum with the highest potential. And this turns out to be directly a social uh, optimum, uh, uh, a stable social optimum. So, by a previous result, these games have finite uh, level and uh, finite selfishness level. Now, this does not mean that it's easy to compute it. And in fact, in the paper, uh, it's based on our work, we have uh, calculations for specific type of uh, congestion games, a finite congestion games, and also for the fair cost sharing games, but these are pretty complicated formulas. And these formulas also provide some intuition what is at stake. But uh, it is, these formulas are too elaborate, so I decided uh, to shorten the presentation and you can see those formulas in the slides which uh, are or will be available from this lecture, but uh, they are not in this set of slides which are here. I just removed them to not to frustrate you too much. But I want to return to one 
class of games, which we discussed before, uh, Kurno competition. So this was a game which we studied yesterday, which I said is this standard example of the effect of competition on the price, that it was good to set up competition between producers, because this drove the price down. And there, uh, there was a social optimum discussed, a Nash equilibrium. I did not have the vocabulary of price of stability, but today I have, so you will see on the next slide what is the price of stability, very uninformative. But still, it's good to know, and we'll also see what is price of, uh, what is the selfishness level. It's not much better, but it's useful to see what goes on. So this is the reminder. So this expression in the bracket is the pr price of the product, if you remember. So for each player, the payoff is the price of the product, which depends negatively on the level of production, multiplied by the, uh, by the production uh, level for the player i. So this function reflects this end minus the cost of production. So it depends, this, uh, this product depends positively, say, on the level of production and negatively on the price. So we had uh, yesterday, uh, uh, at least I claimed, it's in the lecture notes and it's not complicated to compute, that the unique Nash equilibrium is uh, obtained in such a way and then it leads to a certain social welfare, which is just sum of payoffs, uh, each of them is the same for each player. And the social optimum is some other formula. All what is of interest is that if you divide one by the other, then you get an expression which I did not put here, but you can recover it. It will be this expression, but inverse of it. Because this is the price in the Nash equilibrium, this is uh, the price, uh, sorry, social welfare, I'm sorry, in the uh, social optimum. So you see that these two things are the same. So if you divide, you get n plus 1 squared divided by n. So this is the price of stability and also the price of anarchy because there is a unique Nash equilibrium of this game. So this is some number. And this number uh, converges to infinity. In contrast, for uh, the selfishness level approach, it just uh, provides here an answer that it's always infinite. So it is this difference that one converges to infinity and the other is infinity. It reminds me a joke about the Pope uh, John Paul II, that uh, he was traveling a lot, and then the joke was, what's the difference between God and the Pope? And the difference was that the God is everywhere and the Pope, uh, and the pope was everywhere. So uh, this is like here, what's the difference? The price of stability converges to infinity and the selfishness level is infinity, okay? So this shows that you cannot correct this game to get uh, things uh, solved. So this tension that these benefits of cooperation will always remain. Because the idea was that the cooperation was supposed to lower the price. It will always remain, no matter how you want to change this game by involving those producers in looking at uh, joint profit. There is no way you can avoid it. Now we have uh, tragedy of the commons. You may remember there were two versions. This version uh, is the continuous one. So it was this example of students in dormitory where everybody could claim some percentage of access to internet. And at, if the uh, claims exceeded 100%, then the connection dropped to zero. So this was this example. And uh, it was to illustrate that the overuse of uh, joint of common resources uh, lead to problems. So, um, I just recall what we found out yesterday. So, we found out yesterday that the best Nash equilibrium was when each of the 
uh, players claims one over n plus one. So when you add up how much they claim, there is still one over n plus one left of the resource. And then the social welfare is obtained, uh, summing up a very simple expression, this one. And then uh, for social optimum, I told you it's just a very simple uh, way of solving some function, quadratic function, uh, by using derivatives. It turns out that it is obtained when you use half of the resource. And how you redistribute it over people, it doesn't matter. So then uh, the, if you divide this, then you get uh, therefore n plus 1 squared divided by n uh, times 2. And then uh, this is an expression which goes to infinity. So the price of stability converges to infinity and again for each n the selfishness level is infinite here. And uh, how do we prove such things? We just take this appeal factor and then show that it can become unbounded. So this is the standard way. So you have to, so to say, analyze a specific function. So again, it is this John Paul II joke here, the difference. Now, uh, I can also mention that just as the case of the price of stability and price of anarchy, you can study this problem in different ways. Suppose that you uh, do not want to focus only on Nash equilibria because you will say it has a deficiency, sometimes they do not exist. Whereas, as you remember, I mentioned, but I'll discuss this in detail tomorrow, if you move on to those mixed uh, strategies, then for finite games, if you start with them, uh, a Nash equilibrium always exists. So you might consider that you will study this problem uh, in a slightly different way, you will uh, look at rather the class of Nash equilibria, namely uh, in mixed strategies. And the question is, does this matter? And the answer is yes, it changes a lot. So, uh, first of all, in, some, in certain situations you get uh, meaning or positive answer. So, for example, we notice that in this matching pennies game, there was a Nash equilibrium in mixed strategies where each player put 50% on each of the two strategies. And in this game, the, uh, all, uh, let's say, possibilities yield uh, zero uh, because it does not change, and also in Nash equilibrium. So in such a game, you don't need to change anything. The selfishness level is zero because the resulting game already has the good property. But it can happen that the selfishness level can go down if we use mixed Nash equilibria, which in principle is not so surprising because you uh, would say that uh, you now uh, have more Nash equilibria, so in some sense uh, you only want that one of them gets good grade, so to say, but you have a larger set to choose from. So here is... Uh, an example, uh, consider this game. And uh, the important things are in red and in blue, because uh, you can just see that CC is a social optimum, but additionally it is a stable social optimum. Because look, this game has several social optima. HH is also social optimum. But why is HH not of interest to us? Because from there a player can deviate to, for example, uh, HT. It is a better, uh, strat a b better joint strategy for player 2. And it is again a social optimum, which means that by definition HH is not a stable social optimum because you can profitably deviate from it to another social optimum. But this is not the case with CC. In CC, you can only deviate, uh, let's say, in a column or row, into, a other, into another joint strategy where the social welfare goes down. So it is a unique uh, social optimum which is stable. 
And the um, unique Nash equilibrium is DD with the payoffs 1-1. One, one. And in this game, one can easily check the selfishness level is one. That is to say you have to add one unit of social welfare to everybody to correct this problem. And then this uh, DD becomes, uh, uh, sorry, CC also becomes a Nash equilibrium. Now it isn't because the players can switch and get three instead of two, as you see. But if we reason about the mixed extension of this game, then all of a sudden this left corner, which is uh, very similar to uh, matching pennies, becomes relevant. And then putting 50% on H and T and zero on the remainder for both players turns out to be a Nash equilibrium in mixed strategies. And in that case, we get uh, already a good Nash equilibrium because the social welfare is as good as it can be. And therefore, in mixed strategies, the selfishness level of this game is zero. So the reason I uh, showed this example is that original uh, definition until, let's say, two slides ago would bring us to a conclusion that to modify this game we have to add one unit of social welfare. But if we study a large number, larger number of, uh, uh, sorry, larger, oops, larger number of uh, strat uh, Nash equilibria, then in fact we don't need to make any changes. So it depends what solution concept you are interested in. So uh, in paper there are many other examples of games and also some other considerations, including uh, games which are so-called uh, extensive games, which I discussed yesterday in Nash equilibria there. There, there are also examples of games with so-called so bad Nash equilibria, and we show how you compute in such cases this Nash equilibria. But uh, this should give you a kind of satisfactory uh, picture of, of this uh, area. Uh, so I would summarize it as follows, that uh, what happened after the break is we introduced a kind of competing approach which is normative. We want to know how to correct the game by involving players through this altruistic version of the game and how to do it with the smallest amount of, so to say, additional investment. And uh, in several cases this can be done, it yields specific numbers and these numbers can be used to analyze the, let's say, what are the factors in the game. Uh, in some situations it does not make a difference, like in Cournot uh, or this uh, uh, tragedy of the commons, but the same is with the other approaches, they also don't provide much uh, insight. Uh, in some sense it is good that such a game like this Kurno competition cannot be repaired because no matter how uh, those producers would try to arrange things between themselves, sharing profits and you name it, they cannot, so to say, kill the idea that competition is good for the customer. There will be always this discrepancy which will mean that there will be always a better price lower price in Nash equilibrium than in social optimum because social optimum is best for the producers. So it is worst for uh, the customers. And uh, this simply shows that no matter how they try to arrange things between themselves, competition will always remain useful. So I will uh, guess I will finish slightly earlier. So I will just uh, mention uh, two quotations, which uh, now look strange, uh, but uh, I should have shown them in the beginning, and now you could see that you can understand better what they mean. So one is surprisingly a quotation of Dalai Lama uh, from a book on economics, and it is a strikingly intelligent uh, uh, quotation or statement, the intelligent way to be selfish is to work for the welfare of others. You can look at this now through, uh, let's say, examples like this public goods game. 
you can be selfish and you can say it's better for me uh, to free ride. But it turns out that it's a short-sighted policy. That's the, so to say, message. And the other is from a very important book, which is almost exclusively uh, uh, consisting of attempts to solve prisoners' dilemma. And it was an extremely important and influential book by Axel Roth, The Evolution of Cooperation, where he studied various ways how one could overcome the prisoner's dilemma. And there I found this interesting quotation. An excellent way to promote cooperation in a society is to teach people to care about the welfare of others. Does this sound familiar to you after what you heard uh, uh, today? So... In some sense, you can think that this whole uh, exposition is nothing else but taking such uh, quotations literally and trying to turn them into uh, some quantitative analysis. It's just like if somebody would say competition is good in, among uh, companies, that it's good for the customers. That's what Cournot's game shows. So we try to somehow make those uh, quotations more uh, appropriate. So... This is a contents of a paper which we published in 2014 and uh, it's an open access journal as each journal should be and the paper uh, additionally will be added or is already on, on the website of this course but uh, if not then you can just find it in the original journal which is an open access journal. Okay, so I think I finished for today. Um, perhaps I did not give you enough chance to interact, but it's your last chance for today at least. So, any questions or complaints? No? Okay, so let me summarize uh, that um, what happens is that uh, I'll sort of give some sort of personal account of uh, why I was interested in all this research and why these games. Uh, when you teach game theory, you have to somehow get people interested in the topic. So I taught uh, strategic games for a number of years and I realized that the only interesting purpose of this is to convey, to convey some message. So each game illustrates some problem. And these games were proposed usually, not exclusively, by economists because they wanted to understand the effects of economic interaction. And by doing so, they discovered that there is a difference between what ideally people would select and what is best for the society. So this is this discrepancy between the social optimum and Nash equilibrium. And additionally, they also discovered, like this brass paradox, it's actually a German engineer who discovered it. He also discovered it with uh, some physical example of some uh, springs uh, that if you sort of rebalance them, then uh, you get uh, worse results than if you would put them separate. But uh, the point is that people noticed that uh, game theory provides you with a certain vocabulary to study some phenomena which we all informally understand. And what computer scientists added to this is this quantitative analysis. So this price of anarchy informally existed, but economists did not quantify it. They just noticed that these things differ. And with this price of anarchy and price of stability and selfishness level, uh, computer scientists moved in and tried to quantify these differences. And now you can argue what these numbers mean. So uh, there are two ways to look at it. One is like with this... Um, price of anarchy for affine congestion games, that it's 5 over 2, which would mean if you let people decide, then the loss for society would be at most, uh, let's say, 2 and a half, so say that 40% will be achieved instead of 100 Whereas in, with the selfishness level, you can say which uh, things to modify 
to induce uh, changes in the right direction. But it all provides you with a certain better understanding how you can influence the reality and how you can measure uh, the problems which arise, but it also allows you to focus on this dilemma. And this dilemma between the difference between social optimum and Nash equilibrium is a driving force among uh, the, in the area of strategic games. It is one of the, so to say, most important threads and uh, this is essential to understand what is the purpose. The purpose of the game theory is to understand how to deal with it and how to discover and how to measure it. So this was what I wanted to discuss today. Now, since we have still some epsilon time, then let me tell you what I will discuss tomorrow. So I'll discuss a class of games which we came up with to study changes in social networks. So social networks is something which you would consider is impossible to study formally and it is completely wrong. It's an area which spreads over several disciplines and uh, we will study it using game theory. So this will be tomorrow and I will uh, use this to show you another paradox that it is sometimes not good if more products are available on the market. You will just see uh, an example tomorrow. Uh, and then I will also uh, conclude by going back to these examples I mentioned during the first lecture. So what, are, what is the essence of the results of von Neumann and Nash? So I will provide you enough evidence that you, uh, let's say, enough information that you can appreciate the beauty of the resulting proofs. Okay, so I guess that that's it for today. So thank you for your attention.